This program is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Jennifer Coolidge, and you're listening to the Horror Fry Podcast. I'm here with Michael Combs. And we have Mike Martin over there. And Keith Clanton. No, it's Jennifer Coolidge, dumbass. (laughs) Just kidding. It's me. It's me, you guys. It's me. Okay. That's disappointing. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. (laughs) That was really nice. Um, We are back, y'all, with episode four in our queer southern horror series. Nope, not (laughs) southern, just queer. Okay. (laughs) Y'all, we haven't recorded in a few weeks, so it might take us a minute to to get there. Um, But it's been a while, so what's everybody been up to? Mike's, I mean, the one I that's been busy. Mike's been all over the world. Yes. I literally have been out of the country and everything for the first time ever. Yeah. Tell everybody about it. I just went on a cruise. Um, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> well, well. Where'd you go? Went to Belize, Honduras, and Cozumel. And it was absolutely wonderful. What was your favorite part of the cruise? Did the you do any cruising on the cruise? Um, No. No, I did not. <laughs> um... I would say, I mean, I I mean, if anybody that knows me knows I'm going to say the food, so the food, I mean, as much as you it's want, amazing. whenever you want, just eat to your heart's content. Really? You don't have to pay for it? It's included? Yeah. Oh. See, I've never been on a cruise. I don't know. Literally, there's a 24-hour pizza spot <gasps> on the cruise. You'd love I would that. come back 25 pounds heavier. <laughs> <laughs> Cozumel, no thank you. I'm having pizza. To, <laughs> like. Yeah, I mean, you can literally wake up 3 in the morning. And if you want to go get some pizza, it's there. Wow. That sounds pretty fun. Yeah, I've never been in a cruise. Makes me nervous because I feel like I would get sick. I mean, you're moving. Yeah. You're, you do get motion sickness. Yeah. Moving and grooving. Michael, what have you been up to lately? Before you take a sip of that fireball. And, uh, hanging out with you, that's about it. <laughs> oh, we went to a con. Thank you. We did we go all, to a con. We all went to a what con did, last weekend. We did. We went to a con. Mike went to the con. I yep. did. I took my nephew to the con. It was his very first horror convention. I think he had a good time. He seemed like he had a he good had time. He had a wonderful time. Yeah. And he actually listens to the He's the only family member of mine that listens to the podcast. Hey, so. Tevin. Hey, Tev. Love yeah. you. <laughs> um, but something really cool that happened was... Um, Blumhouse producer Ryan Turk was there, like, walking around and enjoying his time at the con. And we were outside, and he came out to have a cigarette, and we kind of wanted to, like, get a photo with him, but we didn't want to be the those people because he was just there enjoying the con. At least I think he was. I don't remember him having a booth set up or anything, so I think he was just there. And uh, my nephew grabbed the bowl by the balls and <laughs> got his autograph, which I thought was kind of cool. Definitely a lot braver than the rest of us adults. Yes. So, but also, he's not going to turn down a kid for an autograph. Like, I feel like if a 35 year old man or woman was like, hey, can I get an autograph? He'd be like, I'm just kind of enjoying myself. But you get a 16 year old, he's more likely to be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So, that was kind of cool. It was cool. It was cool. It was fun to watch. I was happy was for cool. him. Yeah, I was really happy for him. Um, so, in an effort to uh, uh what sort i'm looking for current yes thank you <laughs> thank you in an effort to stay current like we do cover a lot of older movies um to keep with our season's theme but we wanted to do something a little different because we also go see movies and if you follow us on instagram you know that we usually post a rating but we thought why don't we do like a quick spoiler free review of the movie to kind of give a little bit more insight as to why we rated it the way we we rated it. So this is a new segment that we're calling, Hey girl, I'm in the movie. Hello. Hey girl, I'm in the movie. (laughs) Hey girl. Hey girl. (laughs) What are you watching? Shake a spear in love. So what did we go see? So we all saw infinity pool um over this last week and if you saw our instagram post you'll know that we gave it a three which is a medium 
Um, I, I'm just curious, like what 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 was your reasoning behind your scores? Which I know we were unanimous. Actually, we all rated it a three. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Mike, what was your takeaway from Infinity Pool? Um, well, that's a pretty loaded question <laughs> as far as this movie goes because the takeaway was a lot. Do I understood what I took away? Probably not. Um, yeah, zero cents. Yeah, yeah, and. I obviously, I mean, I do love Alexander Skarsgård. It, I mean, you know, he's swoon worthy to me. But he is. like, but where was the beef? Right, I saw more of him in True Blood and yes. in what was the Big Little Lies? Yes, like, he got his dick broken in yeah. Big Little Lies. <laughs> so I was that was a little, you know. But I guess you know they substitute not seeing his dick for like a jizz scene, so you know there's that. There is a jizz scene, oh y'all, and it's pretty early on in the movie mm-hmm. too. So I mean, again, we don't want to like ruin anything for everybody, but uh, I'm beginning to think, and I literally will probably get shit on for this, but I think personally, this is my opinion. Okay, as Tamara Judge <laughs> okay, Tamara. would say, <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> That Mia Goth is a one-trick pony. Uh, at this point, I so here's with Mia Goth. Here's my problem with her. I actually did not think she was all that great in X. Like she was just like she was fine, but I felt like Britney Snow stole the show in X for me. Pearl, while I didn't like the movie nearly as much as I liked X, I thought Mia Goth was much better in Pearl. But now, having also seen Infinity Pool, I'm like. Okay, so she's Maxine and Pearl, literally. Like, that's that's all I'm getting from Mia. And I'm sure she can do more. That's just all we've seen her in. So I'm getting a little bored. Um, Michael, what did what did you think overall? I thought it was weird. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like a weird movie, but this was just too weird for me. Well, I almost feel like I started it. It started and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm really going to be into this. But then it just kind of lost me. I don't understand. It was hard to follow at times. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Well, and it also didn't help, you know, obviously they're in like a foreign country and stuff. And like some of the dialogue between like, like the locals, I was, it was hard to understand like mm-hmm. what they were saying. So that kind of threw me a little bit, but, um, I agree with you and Mia Goth. Yeah. I am very curious to see after Maxine comes out. Yeah, I want to see what Maxine's going to be like. Well, I mean, I think she's going to be essentially kind of the same. However, I'm just curious to see after Maxine what Mia Goth does. Like, yeah. that's what I'm curious to see. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like at this point she's becoming a one-trick pony. Although I was interested. I I thought it was curious to find out that I guess her accent in Infinity Pool was like her real accent. Yes. Yeah, yeah she's British, isn't she? Yeah. Because when I saw the trailer... I remember being like, God, that's a terrible accent, but that's actually her real accent. <laughs> so, oh. Yes, that's her real accent. Um, I did think she looked great in the movie, but I don't know. I I really liked, I, like, it gave me White Lotus vibes, like, towards the beginning of it. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. But I don't know. It was just weird. So, yeah, we gave that a three out of five, a medium. I think people should watch it, but. I don't think I'll ever watch it again. But, really? Oh, yeah. I probably won't either, honestly. Mm. But if you can make any sense of it, like, please slide into our DMs and let us know, because very confused, and we can't really give too much away. Like, I have my own personal thoughts, but I don't want to give anything away. It's, you know, still in theaters. So anyway. But we're open to communication if you want to talk about it. Yeah, please, please, please send us uh, any information or what you think about it. All right, so on to episode four. Um... Of course, we always want you guys to follow along with us so you can find a list of all the movies that we're watching this season on our Instagram page at the Horrified Podcast. So now, let's sit a spell and talk about fear... Nope. (laughs) Nope. That was last week. (laughs) Let's talk about The Hunger. Mysterious. Sensual. Strange. Perverse. Riveting. The Hunger. Life signs terminate right here. The Hunger, a modern classic of perverse fear. The Hunger, rated R. You definitely are rusty. I know. The Hunger was released in 1983, directed by Tony Scott, 
actually based on a novel by Whitley Stryber. I'm hope I, I hope I'm saying that right. And honestly, after seeing the movie, I would really like to read the book because then I feel like maybe I would have some sort of indication as to what was going on. Um, but written for the screen by James Costigan and Michael Thomas, starring Catherine Deneuve. Yes, not Deneuve, like I'd been saying. But Catherine Deneuve, David Bowie, Susan Sarandon, Cliff D. Young, and a young Mel Horowitz, Dan Hedaya. Michael. Yes. Kick us off. Well, we are introduced uh, to Miriam and John Blaylock in a club as they... I guess, flirt with a different couple who they bring home to their house and proceed to start to engage in sex with them and then slit their throat and eat them or drink their blood. So you find out, I guess, they're vampires. Um, You then see Miriam and John as they kind of go through their day and um, John realizes that he's starting to age. And that's troubling him because he's a vampire, so he thinks that he shouldn't age. And that's where he goes and uh, meets Dr. Sarah Roberts, placed by Susan Sarandon, to try and help him understand and stop his aging. I'm going to stop it there for that first act. Well, let me just say this. The whole opening, I really liked, okay? I thought stylistically it was really cool. It was very like 80s underground kind of grunge. I really liked. It was dark. They seemed very posh. Um, I just liked the whole style. I liked the music. Now, I will say this, you know, speaking of, um, we're just talking about Infinity Pool. The beginning of Infinity Pool, there is a, a disclaimer saying if you're prone to like epileptic seizures then you maybe you shouldn't watch the movie because i guess of all the lights flashing and stuff well where was the warning for this movie they didn't care in 1983 there was a lot of stuff happening in the <laughs> opening i started this movie and immediately was like i feel like i'm gonna love this <gasps> me too and because i mean just a little heads up for everybody with me i've always been obsessed with vampires so I, this movie has been like on my radar for a long time and I just never, for whatever reason, saw it. But so when it started, I was like, oh, this is kind of hot. And like, it was very like eighties glam yeah. it had like those old sunglasses. Yeah. And, well, they were all smoking. I was it about was, to say everybody smoked. Every, they loved the cigarette. <laughs> well, there, here's one thing you can always count on. Doesn't matter what movie it is, Susan Sarandon's gonna be smoking a cigarette. Yeah. yeah. Like, always. But I really thought the opening was really cool. I got a little confused by the monkeys, but like in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, this is probably gonna come up later. You know, and so it, I, it didn't really bother me that much. And it did come up later. Um, but I, yeah, I loved, I thought the opening, it, the opening was very promising. I just, I feel like that's a common um, visual for like, vampire movies that want to take that like more gothic approach it's always like oh let's put them in this like underground club. club and i feel like the queen of the damned was very much like that right? yeah yeah kind of and i mean i mean well we don't have to talk about the sequels to the lost boys because they're not that great but there is one where they it's very similar to that and everybody's like wearing leather and just you know living their best gothic vampire lives and yeah yeah and so obviously the monkeys come back into play they're running tests on the monk like aging tests on these monkeys um and susan sarandon is a doctor um but one thing right off the bat that really confused me is when john and miriam wake up it's daytime they're in Mm -hmm. bed like normal people which whatever we've seen vampires in beds before but not in the daytime and I thought, okay, this is a lot different than most of the vampire tropes that we're used to because normally they can't be in the sunlight. And then, you know, piggyback, pig, piggybacking off of what Michael said about aging, then you have John who's aging. Well, vampires don't age. They're supposed to be immortal, mm-hmm. right? Rapidly aging. Rapid, like literally in a yeah. day, goes from being a 30-year-old man to 130. Says, you don't look 30, let's be real. He looks yeah. more like 42. But he says he goes from 30 to, yeah, his late 80s. Uh, yeah. I, 
I will say, before we get like too deep deep into it, most of my notes are questions. Because I have a lot of questions. So I'm hoping that we can, you know. Can answer some of those? Yeah, maybe we can talk about it. Um, But we also see John and Miriam hanging out at home. You know, like you said, everyday life. A beautiful, beautiful townhouse in New York City. In New York, yeah. That literally never has the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, but then they've got the light coming through all the windows, Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I thought visually for a movie, it looked very appropriate for like a vampire yeah like, what you would yeah. think a rich vampire i think lives vampire like. movies are very punk rock like you said but also classic i think a classical mm-hmm. music as well so they balanced it very nicely in well, this movie i thought the opening even with like sh- starting the movie out showing them like you know hooking up with these people whatever mm-hmm. it was more like it was the way that it was like shot and the way it was whatever it was very like erotic it Mm. wasn't so like you know just like filthy it was kind of classy erotica it was almost like it because obviously you know a vampire needs blood to live like that's what they drink but they almost made it seem like it was more of a sexual thing than we need this to live Mm -hmm. you know well and I also want to just point this out because we keep throwing the V word around. Vampire. They, don't they have literally things. never say it. No. They, they don't. never say that they are vampires. No. And it's I don't think we see fangs ever, do we? No. 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 I mean Well, and that's the thing too. Like, is this really a vampire movie? Because again, none of those tropes, like aging, the light, um, they're they're photographed. Their neighbor Alice, a little girl comes and plays classical music with them. She's a violinist. And she takes pictures with her Polaroid camera. Well, you can see them in the pictures. They see each other in mirrors, which usually that's not a thing Mm -hmm. in vampire lore. So, I don't know. I'm kind of with you. Like, the whole movie, I'm like, what is... Are they really vampires? Like, because obviously Miriam is, like, the grand high bitch. Yeah, she's a queen bee. Yeah, so... um, And you get these little flashbacks of her turning John and she promises him a world of youth and immortality and you'll live forever and we'll be together forever and ever but obviously and we'll be young we'll be young forever forever. so like she's obvious she knows something we don't because you know as he's aging she's explaining to him oh well this has happened before you know because he he inquires about that one girl uh, I guess yes. the previous one, he was like, how long did it take for her? And she was like, a week. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, this is th- something that's that's happened. Right. And uh, so, what do you... Do you think that that's why she's so enthralled with, like, what Susan Sarant, Dr. Roberts, is, like, presenting? Right. Like, the sleep and longevity her whole thing that she's her book and her studies well, and the yeah. blood too she has it has to do with blood and because i wrote down blood plus sleep equals aging so it has something to do with like your blood type and the amount of sleep you get right which is such an yeah. interesting concept like when i was watching it i thought that too i was like what that's so bizarre to think that your life could be like longer based on your blood type or the amount of sleep you get good god i feel like i don't sleep like nearly enough for oh let's see when we were watching i was like that's why i look so youthful because i sleep all the time (laughs) (laughs) i take many naps um so yeah it was all uh, i don't know it was very confusing i did like the flashback because i kept waiting i wanted some sort of backstory about how they met and so obviously when they do it's a different time like all together so yeah. he's been around for a long time does he ever say how like how i think it's 18th century france at, at some point they do say something like 18th century okay okay and then you do see a flashback of her in egyptian times so yes you do which would explain the little egyptian uh-huh. pendant her little onk symbol. yeah uh-huh that they wear um which that comes up a little bit later um i mean i can probably talk about it now because i don't think it has it's not like a big thing but 
at one point, um, she's playing a song on the piano, right? Yep. And Susan Sarandon says, well, that sounds like a love story because she tells her about mm-hmm. it. Well, she talks about it being a, like about a human, like somebody, and their slave or their mm-hmm. like maiden or something. Well, then later on in the movie, you get that flashback of her when she was in Egypt, and it looks like that could have been, been her, her handmaiden. And yeah. so the song was about her. And it was a love song. And it yeah. was a love yeah. song. Um, I mean, that does it's not like a huge plot point of the, of the movie. I don't feel like it's just something that gets brought up. And honestly, I think it's one of those things, like, if you're not really paying attention, you kind of just glaze right over it. You're just like, oh, it's a flashback nothing um but yeah so he's aging which the aging part with him i mean i was i was pretty impressed with how they like did it like it seemed like every time they cut back to a close-up of david bowie it was just more and more and more and i was like because for a minute it took me a second to realize what was happening yeah, it was very subtle at first. Yeah, and then the longer he sat in her doctor's office mm-hmm. or whatever, it was just like more and more until obviously, you know, when he walked out, he looked like he was in his 60s. Literally a completely different person. Which I thought would, I mean, credit to the makeup department because I feel like they did a really good job on that. That's what I was going to say. For a 1983 movie, which was probably filmed in like 82, so early 80s, the like the visual effects and the practical because that's all makeup none of that cgi like that really good even at the end which we'll get to later there's a lot of that kind of thing but they did a really good job i thought with that i thought they did a good job till the end then it just looked like a plastic mask to me but latex <laughs> well don't get ahead of yourself there, sunshine <laughs> sorry um so after john leaves you know, he's at the, uh, I mean, would you call that a ta- yeah, a townhouse or whatever? And Alice comes by, I guess, to bring some music for Miriam. Leave her a note. Leave her a note, because I guess yes. they're not going to be able to play whatever. And I guess, I don't know, I was just thinking, okay, well, it's this young kid. He's going to drink her blood, and everything's going to be better. Like, I thought maybe that's why he was aging. And I think that's what he thought. Yeah, right. And yeah. maybe he thought, well, let me get this young kid. Because I think Alice is only supposed to be like 13, 12 or 13 in the movie. Um, And he kills her. Which there's not a lot of gore or on-screen deaths, I feel like, in this. You'll see a throat slash, and that's about it. Yeah, yeah and some blood splatter. Yeah, and that's... it's literally like just the neck. Like, that's all you ever see. Um, but he obviously, you know, it didn't work. Alice's blood did not do the trick because he's still a little frail old man. I wonder, did he burn the body? Cause yes. we'll find at the beginning, they burned the bodies. Did he burn the body afterward? I think he did yeah. because Miriam went down when she found out yeah. like what he did. And she had that photo yeah. and she yes. threw it in there. So yeah. Yeah. And we also didn't, we just kind of didn't mention it, but like, you know, where he's kind of having his time where he's like, God, do I need to like feed to like get younger or whatever? He's in the bathroom with that guy. Oh, that's right. And he's like at the hospital or wherever he's planning on taking him out too. But then that guy comes in the bathroom and throws it off. Yeah. He does attack a roller skater too. At some point. Yes. Under the bridge or whatever. Oh, really? Did Mm -hmm. I miss that? There was some guy roller skating, and he didn't do anything though. He literally just cut his neck. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And then he le- and he ran off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So that's I, right. Which I thought was kind of weird because I was like, well, I mean, did you just get scared because you were out in public or? Yeah. Like- <laughs> well, I'm like, well, you slow just throw it. You might as well just go ahead and drink. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know. It kind of seemed a little like, you know hocus pocusy where we have to like suck the lives out of little children to like <laughs> live to live and to be, stay young and, and beautiful be young again <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah except for it doesn't work in this movie no except for so also i mean you know i feel like one of my big questions and maybe we can touch base on this a little 
is like, so what? What is the difference? Why does this not happen to Miriam? Like she's. I don't know. Like I don't understand why it it doesn't apply to her. All I can think is she's the first. Well, like, the original. Is she, is she Lilith? She could be Lilith. That's a good. Oh, I like that theory. She could be Lilith. Yeah, well, that's in vampire lore. Like Lilith was in the beginning. God created was Adam's Adam and first Eve wife. Lilith. You know, I mean, that's what they say on True Blood, anyways. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know like what the actual lore is, but that's what they say in True Lilith Blood. Lilith was Adam's first wife, but she was created from mud too, instead of from his rib, and so she wasn't subservient, and was like, "Fuck you, I'm leaving." Well, I thought in tr- okay, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it's been a long time since I saw this season of True Blood, but I'm not I talking about it- True Blood. I'm just talking about well, no, no, no I'm mythology. just saying like I, I felt like in True Blood they mentioned. That God created Lilith and then created Adam and Eve for her to feast on. That might be wrong. I don't know. No, they could have just taken liberties with it. Well, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. (laughs) But that's what I'm saying. The only lore that I know is from True Blood because that was my jam. I mean, they also had Bill turn into Lilith. So, I mean. Oh, yeah, who knows? You know, we can't really trust True Blood a whole lot. No, but, but, I mean, it could be Lilith, right? Maybe she's Lilith. But it still doesn't explain how, like, I want to know what sparked his aging. Like, how come you're aging out of nowhere? Did it have something to do with the blood that you drank at the beginning of the movie, those other two people? Like, there's a lot of study about the blood and the sleeping with the monkeys. So the only thing that makes sense to me is they got a taste of some kind of blood that was a dominant blood type or something that, like, Sped wiped up his aging? them out. Maybe. But, I mean, they don't ever say that, so I don't know. That's why I'd be interested to read the book. I feel like the book would obviously Answer some of these explain questions. these things more because it's not, you know, you can't watch it. So I feel like they would, there'd have to be a little bit more backstory. But that's what I think. Like, she's the one true immortal. And you can be immortal, but then maybe you get the, I don't know, old well, blood and it's going to wipe you out. I don't know. And I mean, I don't want to like dive into too much because I know that you'll we'll probably we're getting close to cutting into the next like part. Yeah. Yeah. But like going back to where we said obviously this has happened before we find out again that clearly this has happened before because of everything that she has upstairs. Yes. Like, I mean there's so, a lot of bodies up there. Yeah, all her like lovers is uh-huh. what I took it as. Uh-huh. So, I mean, many years of lovers. Yes, she was like Kylie Minogue up in there. All these lovers. <laughs> I like well, that reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I did it, Michael, just for you. Yeah. Um, do you want to go? Should we start the next little? Sure. Um, so, um, David Bowie, John ages very rapidly and he confronts Susan Sarandon and he says you said I I I would be around forever you said I would be young forever do you mean Catherine no he says that to her to Susan Sarandon I'm sorry to uh Catherine Deneuve's character Miriam Miriam that was a lot of names I was like who's Catherine <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Deneuve Miriam one and yeah. the same Mary at one point she's called Mary anyways go ahead um and she said you will basically you will live forever but you're not gonna be young and takes him takes him up to her whatever and puts him in a casket and that's when you see that there's tons of caskets and obviously years worth of lovers up there mm-hmm and she susan sarandon comes to her house looking for john miriam says that he's gone off to switzerland so sarah keeps getting drawn back to miriam Uh and goes back to her house and they have a lesbian love tryst and that's where (laughs) miriam turns sarah into a vampire or whatever it is whatever we're calling them whatever it is yes a bloodthirsty person Well, can I just say... Yeah. Susan was very, like, modest about not wanting to show her chest in Rocky Horror Picture Show. And had no problem here. And then in this, it was like... She wasn't wearing a bra in any scene. 
I'm no. glad that you brought that up because I had it in my notes. I was like, oh, a lot has changed over the last few years because she was the only, we talked about it on the episode. She was the only one that didn't show her boobs. And in this movie, it's just like. Eight years later, she it's didn't It's showtime. Care. Like, yeah. let's pull them out. Yeah. And let's just let like, you know, another woman just suck on them and feel them and. Whatever. Let, yeah. I'm going to smoke my cigarette. You go yeah. down on me. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot. Um, so, first, let's just talk. So, obviously, Sarah goes to visit Miriam. They have their. That's the when she's playing the piano and she asks her about the love story or whatever. Well, she really goes over there because she feels bad because she turned oh, yeah, John 100%. away at yeah. the the clinic or her office or whatever. Yeah. And then when she found out, oh damn, he was actually telling the truth. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's personal gain. Because she's a scientist. She wants to figure out what's happening, you know? Yeah. Well, and you mentioned it in your thing. She was also being manipulated, like, like, drawn to her. Miriam yeah, was... they were linked. Yeah. Manipulating her. Which also is something that you tend to see in, like, a lot of vampire, vampire things. Is where, you know, they have that weird bond and that they kind of... glamour you. Yeah. Well, what, we didn't talk about that one part. Where Sarah's doing a book signing... Not even looking up, and she can just tell. Mm-hmm. And then Miriam's looking at her. And said, what did you say? And she wasn't even talking to her. Well, that is true. And out loud. So after that, because that's when she gives her the phone number, right? Yeah. Yes. And Susan Sarandon starts thinking that she's hearing the phone ringing all the time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which was kind of an interesting, like, <clears throat> an interesting, like, thing i don't know what the word i'm looking for but like i thought that was cool how she was like in the shower and obviously we just heard a phone ringing too and i we were like oh okay so like you know she's getting the call from her or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then she's like hey hun can you are you get in the phone or whatever he's like i don't what are you talking about yeah i, I thought that was kind of cool yeah. and, and then, then it happens at the office too mm-hmm. where she's like oh didn't I just get a buzz? And the girl's like, no. No, the yeah. didn't ring. <laughs> no there's nothing. Um, and then she even calls, like, the receptionist to say, hey, did you just buzz me? Like, clearly not. Your friend, just co-worker, whatever, just told you you didn't get a call. <laughs> yeah. But you gotta make sure. So there's definitely, they formed a link. They're kind of bonded at this point, And that's all Miriam. Um, so whenever... Susan, because at one point Susan Sarandon leaves, right? Mm-hmm. And she leaves first. And it's just she, a quick visit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. But the 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 truck is almost, coming. So this yeah. happens almost twice. But the truck is coming, and she's not paying any attention. And smoking a just, cigarette. Yeah, smoking her cigarette, and it just stops. And I thought there is no way a semi could just stop, stop like that. Like that. I mean, she would have been hit. Well, Miriam's talking to Dan Hadeda's character at that point and she's like fumbling with something is it her phone number sarah's phone number yes and and then it's cutting back to to sarah during that whole thing like she knows something's about to happen feel it yeah it's just weird because normally whenever there's some sort of a link like that it's because the vampire has some of that human's blood and they can Mm -hmm. sense so none of that's happened yet no um so I'm not really sure. Maybe it's like imprinting, like in Twilight. It could I don't be. know. <laughs> because then she sees Miriam in a mirror, too, before she goes back for the second time. And, and, and in, when, in an elevator, too, right? Yeah. She keeps seeing her. Yeah. And she's not there. And then she goes back to see Miriam, and she's like, I don't, I don't know why I'm here. Is that when they get it on? Yes. Mm-hmm. I will say... I thought that, like, whole love-making scene... I mean, they're not really making love. They're just, like... Kissing sucking and on fondling. Each other's titties and, like, <laughs> yeah. licking each other's arms. I like the way it was shot, though. Like, through a a netting or something. Well, I don't know. that's what I was gonna... Like, it was shot really well. Yeah. And I, am, I almost wonder, like, maybe if that's why Susan Strandon was like, oh, okay, I can be topless for this. This is, like, very sensual, very... That- that's what like kind of goes with the same thing from the beginning. It felt very like, like classy, like erotica, which yeah. I feel like is different. It's not like a sex scene. Yeah, it was like sexy and sensual without like it being in your face. Like it's all implied because you don't see them do much except for you know what what I just said. But like they still, you know, it's implying that they're having sex. Yeah, you know, um, but. 
I don't know. It was weird seeing Susan Sarandon, I feel like, with another woman. Was it? Uh, for me, I think it was. Oh, it kind of felt no- natural to me, but... I mean, well, I, I do I mean, think you do it was see her natural, making right? out and kissing all over those people at the end of Rocky Horror, too, so... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just... It's weird for me to see, because, like, I associate Susan Sarandon with a very, like, motherly, like... Yeah. Like stepmom? What, yeah, like... Like Marmy March from yeah. <laughs> The Little Women. Because, like, those are movies that i guess were kind of like we grew up watching yeah. mm-hmm. so it's it's interesting to see the roles that she was in prior to yeah. being like that kind of more wholesome type character but even Ooh. like thelma and louise like you know in thelma and louise i almost like could argue like maybe they were in love with each other too um a little bit or maybe they were just best friends i don't know but yeah. I don't know, like, even her character in that movie. Like, it's weird. I feel like that was probably the first movie I ever saw Susan Sarandon is, and was Thelma and Louise. But, like, this was just completely different. I did love her short hair in this. I did, too. Yeah. Like, it felt very 1983 Reba McIntyre. Yeah. Like... And even, like, the one outfit she wears where it's, like, lime green, oversized, like, button-down or something. Mm-hmm. I thought she looked really... Posh in, but Catherine Deneuve. Oh, was she was on point this too. Like yeah. every time I saw her, I was like, "Okay, she's beautiful." And I like it, that black veil she always wore. Yeah, and it goes back to okay. Well, she's truly from another time, and you can yeah. tell because even though this is an '80s movie and the beginning is very '80s, they look very glam rock. Like the way that she does her hair and the way that she communicates and plays her instruments, like it's clearly from another time. Like this is a, you know. Or a well Someone that's been around thing. a long time. Well, yeah, even, yeah. like, the beginning with it being that kind of, like... I don't even know that I would say, like, 80s, like, glam. It was very new wave. Yeah, like yeah. That, cause, cause, well, because it was, like, England, or, like, you know, British. Yeah. Like, that's kind of the feel. Yeah. Which is not how 80s in America was. No. So... <laughs> no, that's true. You know, scene I loved is where Sarah's drinking her drink and gets it on her white shirt. Oh my God. And it looks like blood. And then that leads to, it looks like blood. And I'm like, is that foreshadowing? Is that something? It, well, I mean, obviously it symbolizes something. I have in my notes that that whole scene just made me LOL because it really did. When she dropped that on her shirt, she's like, oh. oh. It was very <laughs> dramatic. Yes. <laughs> just so, but... It, I don't know what she was drinking. For some reason, I want to say she was drinking Chardonnay. That's why I was like, why is that so red? Not red. Yeah. So I, that was kind of this, I don't know. I think it it was like a Chardonnay or like something. It was something too. I didn't think it would, I'm like, why is that so red? Well, she says it. She does. And I can't remember if she said champagne or Chardonnay. And Susan Sarandon says she doesn't really care for it, but that's what she drinks. Yeah. And I can't remember which, but it's obviously white or clear like, well that gets susan sarandon's top off it sure does and Catherine but, deneuve goes in for the kill well it was kind of funny because when she goes in to like change or like obviously miriam knows what she's doing you know she um, seduced a lot of people yeah but yeah. it's just it was like they're in there together and it's like susan so Su- well sarah is just getting nude like it ain't <laughs> no thing you know like it yeah. I don't know. I was just like, oh, she's awfully comfortable. But again, I guess it could be because of their connection or, you know, bond. Yeah. Or whatever. What'd you think of the guy? Susan's guy? He was a, I did not like he him. I th- that dinner scene, he was a dick. Well, for a minute, I didn't know if that was actually supposed to be like her boyfriend. Like I was, I'm like, yeah, I didn't know if boyfriend, husband. Well, they're clearly co- co-workers. A couple. Right. Yes. And that was why I was like, well, are they just friends? And they're just kind of like fuck buddies or are they like whatever? But at the end, it makes it seem like they're a lot more serious because he's hardcore. Looking well, I think they them. live together, too, don't yeah, they? Maybe. Yeah. Well, and see, that was another thing because they show her in the shower, like at his place or maybe it's their place. Like, I don't know. But I just remember it didn't since we hadn't really been introduced to them as a couple, I was like, oh. I was like, well, maybe they're just, like, you know, fooling around, and she just stayed the night at his place or something. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, but also, like you say, he was an asshole at dinner. Like, I didn't necessarily like his character, but I also thought she was kind of being a bitch at dinner. So I probably would have had the same She was a little bit of aloof with him. Well, that's because she was seeing Miriam in the pool. 
and Miriam and wasn't there. She was, but it's also because, you know, vampires don't eat real food. And this that was too. after the fact. So I think this was like... She wasted a lot of food. This was before she was like, New. I guess, really transitioning. She didn't know what was going on. And she had that steak, and she cut into it, and I thought, damn, that steak looks good, and she didn't eat a damn bite <laughs> I know, that's what I thought, too. <laughs> well, when he was sitting there, I, I did laugh at this, too, because you saying her being a bitch at the thing made me, at the dinner, made me think about it, when they're talking, and obviously they're getting heated, and he says something... He's like, I mean, do you want to know what I think? She's like, well, no, but you're probably going to tell me anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and then that- she like very aggressively <laughs> takes out that cigarette, like just whoosh, whoosh. The good old days when you could smoke in a restaurant. Yeah, right. It reminded me, you know what it reminded me of? Oh my God. I don't know if anybody that listens to us watch The Housewives, but we are big housewife stands. But it reminded me of that scene when they're on, I don't remember, in Beverly Hills or somewhere, and Erica's getting hot about something. She takes that plate and like scoots it out in front of her and crosses her arms. That's what it reminded me of. I was like, ooh. It was very dramatic. It yes. was very dramatic. But again, I, I, he wasn't my favorite, but I also thought, well, she's kind of being a bitch, so I would probably give her a Well, and it right wasn't back. like he didn't have reason to question. Like, right. Do you think that he knew or had an inkling that she hooked up with her? Yes, because he gets very defensive yes. when they're talking about her going over that. I'm like, It's oh. almost like it's not even a thing, like... You know, you would think in the 80s, like, two women being together, like, oh, yeah, right, that would never happen. You know what I mean? Like, just saying, for the time. But, like, he makes it sound so normal. Like, oh, you went over there with her. Like, what were you doing? Like, maybe this has hours? happened before. Like, yeah. Well, and I mean, because he was very clear about being like, I mean, what do you do for three hours with a stranger? Yeah. Like. Yeah. And she's like, we talked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked. That's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean. I, I, that scene, I mean, he was kind of like just whatever, but by the end of it, like that, that scene towards the end with them, I was just like, okay, well, you're really doing the most. Well, he obviously cares for her right. towards the end, but he is a jerk in that point. But to your point, she was being a bitch to him. She was. I just, I just and then she, laugh. they go home and she's no, throwing up. Tell me about it. Do yeah. what? <laughs> just when she says that it just makes me laugh i feel like that's something i would totally say honestly it is um but i almost feel like he cares for her a lot more than she cares for him i almost feel oh, like for, for sure her, it's again and i didn't really think about it at the time but i think a lot of this like personal gain like i feel like she's with him because it's convenient and they work together and he can make things happen for her aside from that i didn't really feel like she was ever that interested in him clearly not as interested as he as he is in her and he's concerned i would agree with that for right sure. um and then they go home and she is throwing her guts up she's pregnant she is pregnant <laughs> okay so do you think she ate something and it caused that reaction or her being turned into a vampire was causing that well maybe she ate that bloody ass rare steak oh no she well, wasted that well, that's what, kind of what I thought. She like, ordered I, chicken or something before, because he says... It was an appetizer, I think. It was something, yeah. That she ordered, didn't he? But I almost think maybe to appease him, like we don't see it, but maybe she did take a few bites. Well, she is and, drinking wine, though, too, at that point, so maybe the wine... Yeah, but I think... Is, so is, I mean... Does Catherine Deneuve Miriam drink wine? was drinking that Chardonnay, too, so I feel like... Oh, so alcohol is fine. That. Yeah, fine. Alcohol is fine. But... It makes me wonder, because, you know, they make it a point to tell us that it's a rare steak. And I have to kind of wonder if maybe, like, the blood, like, was not agreeing with... Oh, maybe because it wasn't human blood. It could be, yeah. yeah. Like, that's kind of the... That's what I... Oh, I like that. From it. that I thought that sense. if it was some sort of blood, that was just kind of not yeah. what her body needed. Yeah. Right. I mean, what did you think about her transition? I really like the part where they're in the lab and they've done the blood test. And the scientist says to her, you have two different types of blood fighting for dominance. I was like, oh, I've never seen that before. That's kind of cool. Yeah, Miriam's blood was fighting. With her blood mm-hmm. to s- stay human and or be a vampire. <laughs> and then when they like, they're like, what's this? And they show her arm and she's like, it's nothing. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Girl, you look like you just went away from doing some damn heroin somewhere. Did, I was like, going to say, it looked like she was in the bathroom shooting up yeah. with, like, <laughs> some bad needles. Like, it looked rough. I uh, know. It did look, I mean, and I almost, 
at that point, I feel like they kind of think maybe she is on something. Well, like, you know, later on in the movie when she's trying to make a phone call. Um, this was, I think, when she right before she really starts to transition because she goes over there and asks, you know, like what the fuck is happening, and um. I think Miriam says something along the lines of, like, you belong to me now. Like, we belong together or something. And she leaves. Of course, she comes back. But when she leaves, she goes to that payphone phone to make a phone call. And the guy wants to make a phone call. And she leaves. And he says, man, she's strung out or something like that. Yeah. Or cracked out. Or I can't remember. Do you know who that was? I was just going to say no, that. Who was it's it? It's Willem Dafoe. It was, yeah, it was a young William Dafoe. Was it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. He had long hair and everything. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. No, I did that not. Was, that was one of the little things that I had looked up. Yeah. I didn't even realize it. I mean, because it's so quick. Yeah. She and just, his name, I mean, he's in the credits. Like, his name's in yeah. the credits. In the opening credits? Or like at the end. I think at the end. end. Oh, okay. Because you know in the opening credits, I thought there were quite a few names, and I'm like, there's not really that many characters in this movie. So, Mm-mm. you know, sometimes when the cast is really small like that, they might put other people's. Anyways, doesn't matter. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> to piggyback on what Keith said, I love a lot of the lines in this movie because when she does, Sarah does go back to Miriam and says, "What's going on with me?" She says, "You belong to me. We belong to each other." And then she says, "I've given you everlasting life," which is a lie. Yes, she- it is a lie. She does lie to every single one of her lovers. Yeah. Well, no, well, it is everlasting life. You're just not going to stay youthful. Well, but here's the thing: I didn't even really catch up on that until the very end of the movie, and so, I, like, I want to touch on that a little later. But when we get um, into the third act. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of go ahead and because at this point she's transitioning, so we can kind of. So Sarah goes back to Miriam and says, "What the fuck's going on with me?" Yeah. And and Miriam says, "I've given you everlasting life." Um. She takes Sarah upstairs. Sarah's boyfriend comes to um, check on her or see if she's there. He goes upstairs. Obviously, Sarah drinks from him and has now completely transitioned, is what I got from that. Catherine Deneuve, Miriam and her kiss, and Sarah slits her throat to kill herself because she doesn't want to be a vampire. Oh, I mean, you went all the way in. Well, this is the third act. Yeah. I was just like, oh, damn, we're talking about... Okay. <laughs> Miriam takes her up to her little crypt vault, and then chaos ensues, chaos ensues and the movie ends. Well, and there's some confusing there. parts at the end. There's a weird scene at the end yeah. that I want to talk about. But, so when she's, like, transitioning, like, she legit looks like she's... Withdrawing. With, like, yes, in a rehab withdrawing. Like, yeah. sweating and shaking and obviously when her boyfriend what's his name do we know his name i don't remember his name when the boyfriend shows like he's obviously very concerned i would be too and then he saw her shooting up so i almost feel like he thinks immediately oh shit is that tom 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 she's been shooting up with miriam yeah and now she's withdrawing um but he redeemed himself to me in that scene because he is concerned but he just became dinner so pretty much like barges in that lady's house like yeah. Tell and me Miriam happens. doesn't care. She's like, whatever. I know it's going to happen to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just wonder, like, with Miriam, because you said something about how she basically, like, does this with all of her people. Yeah. <clears throat> where she's like, I'm giving you everlasting life, blah, blah, blah. I, I think maybe she thinks that she is. But, like, because I honestly don't know that she even knows why this happens. I don't think she does. Well, and she even told John, and he brings it up. She tells him that he'll be young forever. Mm-hmm. She does tell him that. So she is lying. Because, obviously, that's not the case. I just wonder if, like, each of these people are, like, you know, if everybody's just, like, a trial for her where she has been alive for thousands of years and she's still trying to figure it out yeah like i because i don't feel like she thinks that this is obviously how it's supposed to be yeah but she doesn't really know what to do to fix it well and she clearly has a problem with being alone because as soon as she loses john before she even loses oh she's john, setting, he's aging yeah. she's already like oh I bought i'm lining up the next Sarah, one Sarah, like oh, okay that's the one <laughs> even yeah. david bowie even that scene where he's like yelling at her at the stairs and he like kind of 
alludes to like, oh, are you gonna? Is Alice gonna be your next? Yes. Whatever. Maybe that's. Oh, is that then when he falls why. down the stairs? No, he was still young at this. Oh, point. was he? When he was like, when yeah, she because was... that was before I, he. Killed well, Alice. she was upset about Alice being killed when she figured yeah. out. So maybe she was. Yeah. At some point. I Maybe she thought because she was little, she would last longer than are you so young. I don't oh, know. I mean, maybe they were trying to have like a little baby Kirsten Dunst, like an oh, they interview been. with the vampire. I do like how John was like essentially calling her out for all the bullshit lies she told him. Um, because I mean, I didn't think this at first, but like as the movie goes on, I'm like, God, Miriam's kind of a cunt. Like, it'd be <laughs> it's, it'd be one thing if you like. Did, you know, whatever. We had our little love affair, and then I was like throwing up because I couldn't eat my steak or whatever. <laughs> and then you were telling me, "Oh, you're gonna be young forever. You're immortal. You're gonna be okay, girl. I, I, I'm down with it." Yeah. But <laughs> they're not real. Like she's lying. Yeah. You know. So it's like all these false promises. I wonder if Sarah pieced that together, though. That's why she tried to kill herself because she knew she wasn't gonna be. Well, I. I think so. Or was she upset that she was a vampire? I don't know, but I think she realized what was gonna what was in store for her. She was gonna turn into what happened to John. Yeah, eventually. Yeah, whenever that might be. I well, yeah, because I mean, obviously, she's not an idiot, and I don't think that she believed for a minute that John went to Switzerland. N- right. So, like, she especially considering the last time she saw him, he was like. 70 years yeah, old. Yeah, he went from 30 to 70 so, in a couple hours that and she then, met him. So I don't think that, yeah, I think that she had a pretty good idea that, like... This is what's in store for me. Mm-hmm. And I, it could be part partly that and partly in reta- retaliation. Like, you did this to me so you could keep me around, so... Yeah. Fuck it. I absolutely love that scene where Susan Sarandon comes down after she's eaten Tom and the blood's on her face... She looks and the good, bloods actually. on her shirt. She looks so good. She does look. Good. Yeah, I do love that. Like the hues in this movie are all very like blues, and it makes like the bloody scenes yeah. so much more like vibrant, mm-hmm. which I thought was an interesting like touch. But yeah, when she comes down after that, yeah, she just looked good. I don't know. Mm-hmm. She looked youthful, which she is kind did. of interesting because John certainly didn't look youthful after. No. He- I no. will say, though, when she, like, stabbed herself, I was shocked. I like, thought she I stabbed was, Miriam at first. I did, too, at first. I did, too. Yeah. Until I was like, oh. oh. No, she just did that to herself. Yeah. You know? Um, well, and then we can, I guess, kind of wrap up this whole climax. Miriam takes her upstairs to that... Crypt, whatever crypt, it is. But I don't understand, like, she, like, sits them down in that one spot that almost looks like a gazebo like it there's like a like light a gazebo because yeah. there's a light that shines down it reminded honestly it reminded circling back to true blood it reminded me of like the fellowship of the sun room that they put them in oh, where the yeah. ceiling yeah. opens up yeah. to like the sun can like burn them yeah that's like what that reminded me of but then okay so this is finally so we're here i can finally talk about it i just assumed that these people were dead. Like, they were just dying. See, I didn't and think the they were end, dead. And when they all arrive, like, they all yeah. come out. Like, John wakes up. And all her all other her lovers. All lovers wake up. Obviously, they're decomposed. They're pretty much... I don't want to say they're skeletons. They're not skeletons. They still got a little... I don't know. Skin on their bones? On them. They're nasty. <laughs> yeah, they did a really good job with the makeup, I yeah. thought. Um, but then I thought, wait a minute. Is this in her head? That's is, what I wondered is too. Is this in her head, or are they really alive? And I don't know. What have they been sitting in their coffins for hundreds of years? Like, yeah, well, her and, death. I don't know. Right, and like, what if that's the case? What? Why didn't why they now? do it earlier? Yeah, like, why? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I guess that is where I get confused. Like, I can get on board with them, you know, kind of like wanting to kind of almost get revenge on her yeah but why like why like yeah why now i almost think that maybe she was guilty and it was all in her head and i only think that because when she brought john up there john was couldn't even fucking move yes so why all of a sudden could all of these people move that get out of their own and get out on their own maybe she felt guilty i don't know okay well then 
obviously they push her down the flight of like the flights of stairs, right? Well, they don't really push her. I think she. I thought she like fell over. She falls, falls over the balcony. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's a very long fall. It's a very long fall. I'm like, I, yeah. But once she falls, then she starts decomposing. I thought that was kind of cool, though. Okay, but why? Because exactly. it killed her. But why? But what How? killed her? I don't know. That's the mystery. I well, don't know. <laughs> then it goes back to me thinking, was it something in Susan Sarandon's blood that killed her? It could be. Maybe, Maybe because it was Susan Sarandon tried to kill herself. I don't know. Okay, well... That's what's the, different. Here's the thing. Once she decomposes, or whatever, like, that's pretty much the end of the movie, and the house is for sale, and old Mel Horowitz comes back <laughs> to talk to her, but the real estate agent is there showing the house. Yeah. So, and he even says that they've both passed, I think. I don't yes. think it's a matter of them, oh, they're selling because they moved to Switzerland or whatever. Like, I think he says that they died. They died, mm-hmm. yeah. And... You know, everything's in a trust and is being donated to the a lab. The lab, the which, lab. I mean, Susan Sarandon, that was all her doing, yeah. But then it shows her, and she's alive and well somewhere with a scar on her neck, with a scar on her neck. So I thought, oh, okay, then she really is alive, otherwise, that scar wouldn't be there. But she's in, um, she obviously is married and has a kid. That's what I thought. Oh, I just thought she was in like some house with a bunch of like refugee vampire oh, I, see, I thought she got married and had a kid there were some I, I was like who are these people there were like white curtains everywhere kind of like in their house you know but i don't under i don't understand like it has something to to me it just why didn't she decompose the like the other ones did well i thought she was for sure dead and i just thought that's how it was going to end yeah and that whole part is confusing i just assumed oh okay she's taking her well, life and then like I guess we're still hearing her like yell for Sarah, or right? Yeah. Is that Susan Sarandon like hearing that? Or I think so. Yeah, I mean the last like ten minutes really kind of threw me for like a loop. It is confusing. Is this really happening? Is it in her head? How did Susan Sarandon well, and, live I mean, when she to bled be out? Fair, I could barely understand anything that was happening over the sound of these birds and the flapping. I was going to say you could tell like, Catherine Deneuve was like, "I'm sick of these fucking birds in my face." <laughs> seag- was it seagulls? It was pigeons. Pigeons, pigeons. Oh, she, you could just tell. Yes. Oh my She's god. She's like, "Get it these fucking just... pigeons out of my face." <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. It was between the birds and the flapping of all the sheets yes. and things. Why I was pigeons? Like, this is so distracting. <laughs> yeah. It is. There was a lot. I just. I don't know, like, after I watched it, and honestly, like, sitting right here, and I know we're going to rate it soon, I'm still not entirely sure how to rate it, because I just have so many questions. I, okay. honestly, as we sit here, I've talked about it, Uh huh. because I went into this thinking that I was going to rate it something, and honestly, the more we've talked about it, I kind of want to rate it higher, which is weird. Well, the thing is, is... <sighs> It, there's a, I do have a lot of questions, but I feel like talking back on it, a lot of the stuff earlier on, like I can kind of make sense of, but the ending, I'm still just kind of stumped on. Like if she was the one true immortal, then she what, shouldn't have died. The, what? How did she her die? To decompose. Yeah. All I can think is it goes back to Susan. She killed herself. Maybe Susan Sarandon almost died. They found her and gave her a blood transfusion. I don't know. Well, maybe you know they talk about. The blood, Miriam has something blood, to do with the blood. To dominate, um, Sarah's maybe Sarah Sarah's just one had out. A really strong blood type, and yeah. it ended up canceling hers out or something, and she kind of inherited. I was gonna say maybe now Sarah's like the Grand High Witch, Queen Bee. Yeah, like yeah. If or you know, and common vampire things is like once you kill the main one. Everybody that's like a descendant of them kind of goes back to normal, which... Well, in this case, they all decom- turn into dust. Yeah. Yeah. But see, shouldn't, shouldn't Sarah have then, too? That's Well, but the Sarah never, part. like, technically died Fully yet, transi- right? Yeah, or fully transitioned, maybe. She transitioned. Maybe. Did she? Yeah. I think she fully transitioned. Well, I think she transitioned as soon as she fed on Tom. I do, too. Because that's usually what it is. Like, I mean, just in other vampire things. Yeah, like you have once to you... feed, and that's like the final step. Yeah. I do wonder what exactly killed Miriam, though. Yeah, like, I mean, I feel like, I mean, if they had shown, 
her fall and like something like stabbed her. her or something yeah. like i would be a little bit more right because even then vampires should be able to take a gunshot wound or a stab or a fall from however many stories it everything was. except the stake to the heart. heart that's right and yeah. she didn't land on anything what she just flailed around what they yeah. should have done what they should have done, and it would have made a lot more sense to me, was have her land on her little piano and a shard of like wood or something go through. Went through her. That would have made. Then I would have been like, oh, okay, I get and it. Very poetic. Yeah. Very yes. But I, I just, yeah, I don't understand the ending of that, and I feel like since it was based on a book, I'm guarantee you read the book, it would make a little bit more sense yeah. as to what was going on. I did love, though, how it was shot. I loved how she just started decomposing and how all of her fall, fellow or her past lovers started decomposing. I did like that, even if it didn't make sense to me. Well, I will say, if that was... Because, you know, we're still not really sure. Like, was that really happening or yeah. was that in her head? I almost thought, good for them, because now they're able to finally, like... Get peace. Because if they've yeah. been alive the whole time... Sitting those in those boxes? Bodies, they're just there. You know, so kind of like, good. You know, it's kind of a happy ending. They're getting their lives back. Well, like you said, I mean... Well, not like, getting their lives. Well, they are. They're, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They can move on to the next... Plane or whatever or it whatever. is. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, Miriam has obviously been lying to all of them. Yeah. So, I'm sure that they're probably... Yeah, I mean, like... Well, even John said, he said, shoot me, kill me. Release me. Release me. Yeah. And she's like, that's not going to happen. Well, she just says, the, the way that she says that, though, it's like, I can't. Do like, you think because she can't? Because she loves herself to do it. Gotcha. That's what I took from it. I which mean, is I funny that's very because, selfish of her then, though. Which is funny because that's like the last thing that Susan Sarandon says to her. Yeah. Is the I can't thing. Mm-hmm. She does. I, I can't remember. I can't, I can't do this or I can't be this or something. Yeah. Yeah, because I can't when remember exactly throat. what Miriam says in that moment. But after she like stabs herself and then she's like bleeding or whatever. And she's just like, I can't. So it yeah. all comes full circle. And yeah. I guess you could live that. Cause I don't think she slashed her own throat. She just kind of, as long as she didn't hit that finger. artery. Yeah. yeah. As long as you don't hit the, that, well, and she's a doctor. She would, she know. would know. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe this was all her plan. I don't know. It's, it was very, the ending was very confusing. Not to say I didn't enjoy the ending. It was I just confusing. It when all the lovers came back, and I again, I was happy for them, but I don't know. A lot of unanswered questions. Yes, I, those I fucking pigeons. Can't. Every time we just keep saying all the lovers, it's just. You think of Kylie Minogue? Yeah, it's just in my head. That vi- is that the video where they're all on the beach? No, it's no, it's, it's like a mountain, a mound of, people. of naked oh, people. God, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, I'm sure you have. Yes, I've <laughs> seen it. Um. Um, so are we just gonna talk about, or can we talk about, the the horror hotties up in this movie? Yes. Do you think that there are some? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm sexy. I'm cute. I'm popular to boot. Okay. We're both like okay. yes. God, that was very aggressive. <laughs> but like, I think there's honestly for me there's a few. Really? Okay. Well, well then we're gonna start with you because you seem very. Well, he's very gung ho. I'll very just ready. say this. I'm not, like, a huge Bowie fan. Like, don't get me wrong. I love some of his music, and I think he's An iconic. Icon. Yeah. But, like, the, the I've always liked him in the movies that I've seen him in. Something about David Bowie that is just very sexy. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like... Because, generally speaking, you look at him and you're like, meh. You know what I mean? Like, he's kind of tall, skinny. He's not, like, super fit. Like, kind of has a we- you know, like a weirder... I don't want to say a weird face, but you know what I'm saying. He's just very interesting looking. But there's something that's just very attractive about him and how confident he is in himself, just period. And I think in, even in the movie, I think he's very confident until obviously he starts aging, but then it's like you feel sorry for him. You know what I mean? So I feel for me, I would have to go with Bowie. But on the flip side, like Susan Sarandon and Catherine Deneuve both are so sexy in this movie but for me i would give it to dan hedaya no, i'm kidding oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um 
Um, I, for me, I'm gonna have to go with the two girls again, Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon. Look okay, amazing. but you had to pick one. I'm gonna go with Catherine Deneuve. Yeah, she was just so like everything was perfect. Very posh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm definitely on the Bowie page. So, I, I mean, there's just something about him the like he always kind of has this weird like towing the line of femininity and masculinity yes. androgyny and, like, androgyny like he and, just like, doesn't care and i am really like attracted to that in some i don't know weird way and then like it's very like prince like <laughs> where... i was i was gonna say bowie and prince to me are very similar and that they do kind of like like they're very sexual and masculine but then they might wear makeup or like women's clothing and look a lot more feminine, but like you can't tell me that they're not getting pussy. Yeah. <laughs> Ew. Well, I think. Well, Just I think saying. the same. I think both could be said about both Prince and Bowie. I yeah. think that they were getting it from everywhere. I don't um, well, think that's that, true too. Yeah, I think they were probably very just fluid yeah. in their sexuality. Very but open-minded. I think that Bowie, he just has such a proper and like, kind of like sophisticated, like look to him. Yeah, and then he's always so like mysterious mm-hmm. and just, and he's got those two different color eyes, which is like kind of weird and hot but whatever i also did go see that movie you know his that documentary or whatever about him and that was very eye-opening was it yeah it was good i would like to watch it i just didn't i've the first time like when i was younger the first time i ever even like knew who bowie was was after seeing the labyrinth Mm-hmm. And I remember my like because I was obsessed with that movie and my mom telling me, well, you know he's a singer. No, I don't know that. I was like tiny, you know. But like, I don't know. I just those. It's well, Bowie. It's he's an icon. <laughs> just I went to see Labyrinth in the theater like a few years ago when it was in there for like an anniversary, whatever. And seeing him on the big screen in that and those tights, those moose knuckles, <laughs> his bulge was like massive on I'm that sure theater he had a screen. Cup on, though, right? He probably had a cod I mean, piece sure. or something under there. I'm sure yeah. he did. I but... love the Goblin King. I love that movie. It's so good. Yeah. That's for another episode. Yeah, we can save it for oh, another God. episode <laughs> yeah. or something. This brings me to my favorite part. No. What favorite part? Horror Fright Theater. It's not your favorite part. I hate fucking the Horror drama, Fright Theater. The drama. The drama. Well, you keep acting like that, you're never going to win an Emmy, Eileen Davidson. <laughs> Two times. Daytime. Two time, yeah. Emmy Award winning yeah. Eileen Davidson. I cannot wait to see who we play this this episode. Um. Well, so... Do you want me to go ahead and just intro? Yes. The, okay, so... <sighs> Tell us what we're doing. Um, so this is it was it was a little hard for me to pick scenes from this movie because I was like, okay, well there's obviously not a whole lot of scenes with numerous people. There's not yeah. that many characters. And I was like, and I don't want it to just be like scenes between, you know, Susan and Catherine. And I wanted a little bit of Bowie in there. So and Bowie wasn't in it very long. No. But, so, anyway, so this it, it kind of leads, I kind of did this scene for a couple of reasons. One, because it gave us an opportunity to have a little bit of, like, several characters in it. But then, two, I kind of feel like the the um, the scene where, because it's the scene where Miriam is sitting there watching the TV and she's watching that interviewer interview Sarah about her book and all of these things and i feel like that scene told you a little bit about like almost kind of foreshadows a little bit of what is coming down the pipeline as far as like the her sleep and longevity the idea of immortality blah 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 so um i will be okay because we got a few characters here. So just let's just bear with this. I'm obviously going to narrate it as normal. Um, you, Keith, are going to be Sarah and John. Okay. So you've got 
more of like the TV Sarah because she's obviously on the TV talking to the interviewer. And John doesn't really have a whole lot. Like, so I need to be a proper bitch, is what you're saying. Got yes, it. Yes, and then a sophisticated British man. I can do that. So, no problem. <laughs> um, Michael, you're going to be opposite Keith on the TV. You're going to be the interviewer. Okay. And you're going to be Miriam. Okay. And since... It's your favorite character. Since it is. I expect full... Method? Sophistication, yes. Method acting, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to be Alice and... Oh my god. You know what? I forgot to mention that annoying gum chewing. Mm. Did you pick up on that when she was in the movie? Like when she came this, to leave the note? Mm-hmm. She was chewing I wanted to smack that fucking gum out of her mouth. Well, even when she's... God. The first time we see her and she comes and like rings their doorbell, she's chomping on gum. Ugh. When David Bowie answers the door. I remember. Like, just kill her. Anyways, go ahead. Oh, well, actually, that's literally right oh, here. Oh, this, okay, where the okay. scene starts is when So we need to, take, comes... her place. We need to take her places? Um, so Wait. I'm going to do the narration and I'll do Alice. So Got it. Okay. Um, all right. Are we ready? Yes. All right. Well, gangrene, take her away. Greetings, maniacs and madmen. This is Dr. Gangrene, physician of fright and Nashville horror host. Coming up next is everyone's favorite segment, Horror Fried Theater. Grab your popcorn and refreshments, pull up a slab, and get ready for the madness. The scene opens when we see Miriam watching a news channel with an interview taking place with Dr. Roberts explaining some details about her book. We see visuals of children that are very young but visually look much older. Miriam watches inquisitively. These children are all... Eight, nine, and ten years old, although they have the physical characteristics of someone in their 70s or even older. They all suffer from a disease called progeria. We don't exactly know what it is, but what it amounts to is a premature degeneration comparable to that of aging. What we call the internal clock begins to speed up at about the age of five. It's a terminal disease. The average life expectancy is about 16. Tragic. Yes, it is, and the main focus of our work at Park West is is to try to reverse this process and actually slow down this internal clock. Miriam begins sipping her drink while watching, and John walks in the room, glancing at the TV as well. I won't the you won't use the that magic word immortality, but longevity. Longevity has got to be something that's on everybody's mind. John interrupts the TV and gets Miriam's attention. Sleep well. Come sit here. Come John, here, sit here. John smirks at Miriam as the doorbell <laughs> rings. John walks to go into the door, and we see a young girl standing outside chewing on some gum and flashing a peace sign as John buzzes her in. As Alice walks in, she's holding a Polaroid camera and holds it up to take a picture of John. Gotcha! You look awful. What have you been doing? None of your business. We cut back to Miriam still watching the TV as Dr. Roberts is talking. We have a woman who's well into her 90s, and she only sleeps about two to three hours a night. Believe me, she has far more energy and enthusiasm than any of us. That's fantastic. What's her secret? Dr. Pepper. Well, (laughs) (laughs) when I find out out the answer to that, I certainly hope you'll invite me back. My guest is Dr. Sarah Roberts, and the book, the book is called Sleep and Longevity. It's all about mankind's ongoing flirtation with immortality. Alice walks into the room where Miriam is and walks up to kiss her on the cheek, breaking her trance with the television. Say salami! What? Say it! What? Salami! Alice immediately snaps a picture of her with her Polaroid. That's what all the big time photographers say. Beats cheese. Alice hands the picture she took to Miriam. My dad got it for me in Hong Kong. Neat, huh? Miriam smiles at Alice and we cut to seeing the three of them playing their selected instruments in a circle formation. John on the cello, Alice on the violin, and Miriam on the piano. Miriam's alternating glances at John and Alice, and as she looks at John, she begins to look worried. After a few moments, John stops playing, and the others follow suit. Forgive me. John walks out of the room while Miriam and Alice look after him. Poor darling. What's wrong with him? He'll be alright. He's he's having trouble sleeping. You want some lewds? I got some in my case. What? Quaaludes. Alice. I stole them from my stepmother. Alice! She doesn't care. She's not, she's got them in gross. She's got every pill ever invented. She collects them. Poor woman. That's what my dad says. Says she's scared of getting old. 
we then see John listening to their conversation behind a door, smoking and glancing at the Polaroid that Alice just took of him. He then escapes to a bathroom to examine his own facial features in the mirror. End scene. So this is Dr. Gangrene saying goodbye and thanks for joining us here at Horror Fried Theater. See you on the next episode of the Horror Fried Podcast and be sure and join me every Saturday night for Dr. Gangrene Sanitarium. Saturdays at 9 p.m. on Nashville's NECAT Channel 9 and simulcast on the NECAT Roku Channel and DrGangrene.com. And as always, remember to stay mad. <laughs> Michael. Keith. There was no accent. You know I can't do a fucking accent. <laughs> you can try. And, it, and sound like an idiot? No. There wasn't a lot of, like, long dial. I mean, I did it. Michael, you let me down season one when you didn't do a New Zealand accent. You're I will. Me down again. I will work on my accents. <laughs> we need to get you a dialect coach. Yes, please do. Me. I'll be your dialect coach. I can teach you Southern. All right, now it's time for our final finger licking thoughts here at Horror Fried. We rate our films using the heat scale of Nashville's famous hot chicken on a scale of one to five. No spice, mild, medium, hot, and Nashville hot. Michael, yes, sir. Let's start with you. I think I'm going to give this movie a 3.5. I enjoyed it. I didn't love it. I definitely didn't hate it. Mm -hmm. It was confusing to me at parts. It was very beautifully shot. I think it was acted amazingly and but there was just something i just didn't love it love it if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah 3.5 3.5 solid score mike um i this movie kind of like crept up on me after the fact like i feel like when i finished it i didn't really enjoy it a whole lot but then as I've talked about it and kind of relived it a little, I'm kind of not on that same page anymore. So I'm actually sitting at a 3.52. I'm the same. I didn't mention it, but I was going to give it a 2. But as that, we talked... That's literally where I was at. I When I finished it, I thought, this was kind of boring. I liked it better than I thought I did, yeah. But I think it was because in my head, I had built this... Like, I'd, like I said, this has been on my radar for a long time. So... My biggest complaint is that there wasn't enough Bowie in it. Mm -hmm. Like, that would probably be my biggest. Because I, I do love to just watch him, and I think he's really fascinating. And so for them to just be, like, off with his character that fast, I was like, Ugh. I did expect him to be in it a lot more. Yeah. yeah. But this was also not, like, your typical vampire story, which I guess I was kind of expecting. Mm -hmm. So this was... A different take on it yeah you know well i mean even the descriptions like on like you know all the streaming services and stuff they all make it seem like it's going to be this like vampire centric whatever seducing a young yeah, woman. yeah. and i was like I, I mean i feel like i probably would have described this a little bit differently than that but yeah so 3.5 i would say is where i i'll sit with it hmm. you know it's very interesting it's very interesting to me that we're all three giving it a 3.5 <laughs> like how random but i would give it a 3.5 now i was not gonna go as low as a two but i was sitting at like a three and then i almost thought eh, 3.75 like i'm like i'm thinking way too into it but i thought <clears throat> i don't know that this is a movie that i would ever i, I mean i would watch it again but it's almost one of those movies like you gotta be in the mood to watch it. like i want to sit down and have a nice slow burn you know, because I love a slow burn, but I kind of echo everything y'all said. Like, it was really beautifully shot. The performances were really great. I was, too, a little disappointed that Bowie wasn't in it as long. And I was expecting more of a traditional vampire tale, which I kind of liked that it was different. But I think in being different, I have a lot more questions mm -hmm. than, yeah. than I normally would with a vampire movie. So I would probably give it a 3.5 as well. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's a pretty solid, like, rating. 
That doesn't happen very often where we're all... No, where we're all unanimous. Yeah. No, and it was a first time watch for all of us, too. It was, so. and that's rare, too. Yeah, so normally there's like maybe one. This was about as rare as Sarah's steak. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> oh. oh, my God, that damn steak. I wouldn't have eaten it, though. It looked like it was cooked perfectly. It did look good. Making me hungry. <laughs> the hunger, it's appropriate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, well, thanks for joining us, y'all. If you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and rate the Horror Fried Podcast and catch up on all our previous episodes on your favorite streaming services. Links are available on our Instagram p- page. Um, we'd like to thank again Dr. Gangrene for hosting Horror Fried Theater this season. Y'all can find him on Instagram, YouTube, and at his website, drgangrene.com. Join us back next time where we'll be diving into the classic... I don't know what we're Sleepaway doing. Camp. Is it? Yes. Because <laughs> it's 1983, and that's my Sleepaway bo- my Camp. Birth year. The classic. I don't even <laughs> I don't know. know what it <laughs> Sleepaway Camp. Okay, Sleepaway Camp. Join us. That's going to be a fun episode. I'm really excited about it. I love Sleepaway Camp. I love Sleepaway Camp. It's a too. first watch for me. What? What? I've never seen it. Oh, it's fun. You're going to love it. I almost These boys in short it shorts. Together. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be good. Do you know about the twist at the end? No. Uh, Oh, that's even better. Look, don't ruin anything. Join us next time, y'all. It's going to be a really good episode. Now it's time to swap spit and hit the road. Until next time, remember, there's not a pot too crooked that a lid won't fit. This is Jennifer Coolidge signing off. (laughs) Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Can it pass at me, Mrs. Blaylock?